I I had done traveled too far and went through too much for the last three days. I mean, the minute that I announced I'm going to Louisiana, the devil went bananas. I'm not sure y'all believe me. I'll show you how much God and I are streamlining. No big computer tonight. Wow. I, I, I want to give you a scripture. How many of you remember in, in, in the book of John when Jesus was explaining to his disciples, and this wasn't just the 12 disciples, this was the called. I know lots of folks, lots of men today that are preachers because mama raised them up their whole life telling them, my baby's going to be a preacher. He ain't no more a preacher than I'm an astronaut. <laughs> Oh, he may have went to school and, and, and be ordained, and he may even pastor a church or, or have a ministry, but he's mean as a rattlesnake, and he hurts and wounds and offends everybody he comes in contact with. You know, the truth is, I say really, really hard things. Have you ever thought about some of the things that come rolling out of my mouth? I say this stuff, and I'm standing up here going, oh, dear Lord, help me, Jesus. That was rough. And yet, keep coming back. I asked the Lord one time, I said, how does that work? I, I have pastor friends that will tell me, if I got in my pulpit and said what you said today, they would, they would run me off before I got done with the sermon. I was preaching for a friend of mine down in Texas one time, and I got up, and while I was preaching, I stepped over this way, and I made a, a, about a five or six word statement to this person, and then I stepped over this way and made it to this person, and then I stepped over this way, and, and, and it, was, it was several different statements that I made. And when the service was over, he pulled me in his office, and he said, are you trying to get me assassinated? I said, why? What are you talking about? He said, you went and stood in the faces of five of my members who stood in my office this week and you looked every one of them in the face and quoted back to them word for word what they said to me, threatening me, trying to control and manipulate what's going on in this house. They're going to kill me. I said, well, let me know how it goes. <laughs> I did my part. <laughs> I, you you got to remember, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a called pastor. I'm a called prophet. I personally believe you should beat the sheep daily. <laughs> <laughs> I gave up the the, the, the the hook staff a long time ago. Any of you ever been to one of them Love's country stores? I got a bubba stick with a big old brass knob on the end. Don't mess with me. I love you. I love you enough to hurt you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Even though a lot of times I tell the truth that people decide... Oxygen in the air. It's Twinkie defense. I'm going to 
consume hostess because I weigh 500 pounds. Well, if you wouldn't have eaten 20,000 Twinkies, <laughs> comes down to choice. One of the parts of choice that we don't like to hear about is the reality of the responsibility that goes with your choice. My mama taught me it's okay that sometimes you're going to make the choice to do the wrong thing. I won't stop loving you. But you're going to have to understand that I love you enough that when you make the wrong choice, I'm going to love you enough to give you the hardest for my choice. My parents were in no way physically abusive. My dad never kick us, hit us, beat us, burn us. But he would take his belt off and use it on his Most of the time my daddy used his hand because he wanted to know how hard he was hitting us because he didn't want to injure us. I've heard my mother on more than one occasion say, Alan Roy, you want me to tell your dad heavens. Please tell him so he'll beat me to death. No, don't tell him. My daddy's 78 years old. He's had eight fusions in his back. He has no bone on the back of his neck. He has a wire mesh cage in the base of his back that is the only thing that keeps him from literally falling in half because the bones are no longer connected. He's had three artificial knees because he had one, then he had another one, then he broke the first one, and so they had to go in and take it out and put another one in. Only guy I know, literally, the only guy who met that broke an artificial knee. He fights with melanoma skin cancer. That man could walk in this room right now today and by a look on his face or a tone in his voice, Steve, I'd know whether to say yes, sir, and no, sir, or not. And if he come in this room right now today and told me, you did wrong, and I'm going to bust you, I'm 48 years old, he would have taken the one hit. Thank you. 
and deeper and deeper into myself. And I have held you so deep in myself that to this day, if you stop and listen, you can still count my heart. This is a season in your life when your confidence is going to have to be restored. Because so many have told you what you're not and nobody has told you what you are. So you gave up your dream. You gave up the thing that you were envisioning and hoping for. And you settled into your place. Some, some, somebody in your life has said to you on multiple occasions, you need to learn your place. That's the words, your place. So you settle into your place. But God said you need to know that your place was never my place. My plan for you is much deeper. And it hasn't gone away. I'm not finished. I'm still working in you and through you. It's very important that the thing going on, that there's, there's a crisis happening in the spirit realm in your life right now. Somebody is being offensive. Somebody is doing or saying things. There's something going on and, and you are staying in your place when what you would really like to do is lay hands on someone but they're staying in your place and you're being wounded again. Your old wounds, old scars are being reopened. And God said it's very important in this season for you to stay rested in me because ultimately I'm going to expose the mouth of the liar. I'm going to turn the liar on herself. And then I'm going to stand with you and those who have doubted are going to realize, oh my goodness, she had the man all the time. See, the, the thing is, we, we, we look for people to uh, affirm us. For me, the greatest affirmation that ever comes in my life is when God comes and quietly just stands behind me. I may not even realize he's there. I feel like I'm being really successful because great stuff starts happening. I don't realize that he's standing behind me and it's the outpouring of his glory that's causing it to happen. But he never takes credit. He, he just he stands present in your life and establishes right from wrong. Let's his light destroy the darkness. Yeah. And then everyone around you suddenly realizes, oh my goodness, God really is in their life. There's nothing like that affirmation. When they realize God's in your life, not because you said some prayer that required Him to abide by some law and be your God, but because He loves you and He wants to be there. I've got news for you. God's not in any of our lives that He don't want to be in. If He don't want to be in your life, you're done. He is still God. See, that's what the law was all about. The law was all about people trying to figure out a way that we could set up a system that if I can do all the do's and don't do all the don'ts, then whether I ever know God or not, he has to let me in because I follow the rules. And, 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 we, and we have a tendency to look down our, our nose at the Jewish nation for doing that. But all we've really done is make a system of New Age laws. I, I'm going to say this. This, this is probably going to go over about like a lead balloon. But I, I, I want to just give you a really simple example of some of the laws that we set up. How many of you have, have ever talked to your children about cussing, using curse words. I was a youth pastor 
I had, had a little girl in my youth group, and she was not being smart or arrogant. She was serious. She, I was teaching one night about that, and I was talking about the kinds of words we should or should not use. And she come up to me afterwards, and she said, Brother Allen, I, I had a question. I said, okay, what is it? She said, where's the list? I said, the, the list. She said, yeah, the list of bad words. Where's it at in the Bible? Because I want to I wanna make sure I don't say any of <laughs> And I said, um, well, there's not exactly a list. Well, who made the list? You know what I've learned about sin? For most of us, Sin has very little to do with spirituality and everything to do with culture. I dare you. Go on the mission field. Go ahead. Go on the mission field. Get out there with other people that ain't never seen the things you've seen, done the things you've done, been around the things you've been around. And go ahead and use the normal language that you use. And watch what happens when you say something totally harmless and they all fall down from the table away from you because they think God's going to strike you dead. I went to London, England and was ministering and I was at a table full of ministers and was trying to be very spiritual and anointed but also wanted to blend in with their society and fit with who they were and wanted to be accepted. They asked me if I would be willing to do something and I said, you bloody right I would and the whole room went <gasps> and I looked at my friend who was there with me helping me and he said oh brother, you can't say that. I said why?
that for if there's anybody that that bears witness with, get ready because there's going to be an explosion, and there's going to be a warrior explosion at the top of this grand apex, this grand point. Four hundred one warriors. Who did that? Who's that with? I just moved into the Grand Point apartment. Give her that microphone so she can uh, profit out. Listen. I just moved into the Grand Point apartments in apartment 401. Wow. Wow. Well, I'd say that's for her. Then. <laughs> uh, uh, why don't you stand to your feet, uh, and I want you to stretch your hands toward her. Thank you, Father. You know, I heard Kim Clement say, you know, some people don't go into those kind of realms because they just don't dare to. Wow. And I told Gina, you know, many of you know I live in those realms, but... I told Gina, I said, I'm, I'm more than daring to. I'm going to jump off into it. It builds faith in the room. So is it, what kind of place is it? Is it like a, talk to me about it. It's the, a gated community. Ah. We, in the beginning of the flood, we've been in a hotel room for like three months. We would have been in over five hotel hotels. Um, we're selling my home, getting out of debt with the sale of the home. He's buying, my neighbor's buying it. As is, paying off my house and my car. Um, I, I had a vision a couple of weeks ago while I was in the hotel room about me and Jesus walking in a field and we were flipping stones <laughs> to expose what was underneath. But I knew I was okay because the Holy Spirit was with me and I wasn't being exposed. The lie that was, was underneath that stone that was being exposed. So when I woke up in the morning, I wanted to paint my field because it was my field. But when I painted, I painted Jesus' tomb because every stone needed to be rolled away. He said even my stone had to be rolled away so that people could see the truth and the lie would be exposed, that he wasn't there anymore. And I just, the last time I was with one of your meetings, um, it was... Um, Australian, um, uh -huh. Daniel, oh, he told me that I was going to be selling my paintings. Yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I brought a bunch of my paintings to a place in Youngsville for them to sell them. And the one that I held back was the one about the stone. And I didn't know why. So I think that belongs to you. So, so, it, so, uh, so this place is literally, now let me just clear this to start here. This I'm is not the first like time we did this. Did you slip something in my water? Did you slip something in my water? So you're telling me. Just brought it in the room yeah, when I came in. You're telling, let me say, you know, when you start when the when you start hanging out with prophets and you are one, then what happens is iron arch iron arms. Iron sharp. Okay, iron. Now you've really been around me too long. <laughs> Way too long. So so you're telling me you live at a place and it isn't just like at a point. It's literally called like the Grand Point Apartments. The Grand Point. When the flood happened, God told me, where do you want to live because you can't live here anymore? Uh -huh. What do you want to drive because you can't drive that no more? Uh -huh. And what do you want your marriage to look like because it's never going to look the same? Uh -huh. My husband in the midst of this had a moment where he, he's been attacked physically and he got weak and he left me and the kids mm -hmm. for a couple of days. But since then, we lost all of our kids, sort of, and they're all back, and God is restoring. Stretch your hands. Some come, somebody come stand behind her. Well, you know, here's the bottom line. He knows our name and our address. Now I'll be sending stuff, letters to her at 401 Grand Point. <laughs> but I just pulled that out of the air. You know, there are no accidents in the spirit, amen? Amen. How many just would agree right, that he's got our address, he's got us on the radar? So I just also want to, uh, we continue to move here, but I, I just want to say that the blessing of the Lord is on you. you this, this thing with your artwork is just the beginning. And I also want to say there is significance to the 401 because the 401 is going to be blessings that are poured out. And I literally see it as a double portion because it was, uh, it was like, uh, I don't know, it was two. It was right at 200. What did you two. say when we walked in that apartment? When we went to look at it? What did you tell your daddy? No, not 401K. It's her address. 401 is her address. Yeah. Just to make You said this is the apartment we're going to be moving yeah, in. Yeah, 401 k is a blessing, but he we're going to that. Addresses. that we were going to get that before we got it. Yeah, you told this is the one I want. This is the apartment. So you oh, claimed yeah. it, so that's the double portion. And if you want to claim it for your 401k, that's fine. <laughs> but I'm just, it, I, bottom line, when when profit gets 401 and the address, then it's.
for that. Fire on you right now. Whole thing. Take it off. There it is. Whole thing. You want some too, bro? Whoa! You know. Well, you look nice. You know Superman wore a red cape when you were in the Batman uniform. So I had to say that. I had to be obedient. Well, I, I'm going to do real quick the last couple of things I had to do. And, and I'll be to um, I, I heard the Lord say that the day of ancient sacrifices in your home and family is over. There will no longer be any need to celebrate the gods that have been before. What was in rulership then has been torn down and devastated even to the point that I have plucked up the very foundation of it. There's someone connected with your life that's used to being very in control, but for some reason, everything right down to their foundation has just crumbled, and they don't know what to do. God said there will be no more ancient sacrifices, no more bloodletting in your home and family. The bloodletting of lies and deception is over. I will only allow the word of truth to be exposed in your home, and it will wash your home as though I had dipped it in the pool of Bethesda and used it to stir the miraculous. Things are shifting. I like it when God starts turning stuff and, 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 and doing it quickly. That there is that there's a young lady in your life, connected to your life, and she has two or three friends that are connected to her, and the Lord said that this whole situation is nothing but a Leviathan trying to choke out the life from the young lady that's in your life. She's someone that you love, someone that you care about, it's either a daughter or an adopted daughter or someone you have taken as a daughter, someone that you have pour into and you love her you will strangle her sometimes but you love her and, and, and you have prayed over her and you have shielded her God said I will not allow this Leviathan to destroy her life this serpent you will see the head of this serpent this addiction will be cut off this force that is trying to get a hold of her I don't believe that she has become truly active in this thing yet I believe that it is just trying to surround her and trying to choke the life out of her. God says, as you see this happen, you're going to recognize what it is. And as it is killed off, as the head of this thing is cut off, you're going to find an anointing, an authority that comes up in you, and you're going to speak. Nothing like this will come nigh your dwelling. God says it's your season to begin walking in the authority that I have given you. There's a reason that he has put a sword in your hand. For some reason, he's put it in your left hand. He's put it in your left hand. You're going to have greater accuracy with it. You're going to be able to move with it, and it's not going to hinder you from doing the things that you're accustomed to doing with your right hand. Because you're going to have a sword in your left hand and you're going to be working on the wall with your right hand. There's much deeper ministry and anointing in you than what you typically allow people to say. You try to be humble and you try to be meek. God said, you are a conqueror. But you're not a conqueror of nations. You're a conqueror of kingdoms. You're an establisher of nations. You need to begin speaking to the nations that have come right out of your life and out of your family. You need to begin speaking over children and nieces and nephews and next door neighbor's kids and friends' kids you need to begin speaking over them actively because you are establishing their kingdoms. God said, if you'll do this, I'll use you to speak over young men who will become presidents and business owners in the future. I'll use you to speak over young ladies that will stop being abused 
and will become empowered. You know what it is to have someone hold their thumb on your life and tell you that your life is paused and you'll never move forward. And you know what it is to break free from that. Now you have the authority to speak into their lives and stop it from happening before it ever starts. See, the reality is we've got to just begin walking. We've got to find out what's, what, what's written in that stone. What, what is your word? Also, is there, is there a, is, I know this is interesting, we're not all in this. Is there a Joe, a Joe, and, uh, uh, and then uh, I was getting also the name Adam, Adam, God. Uh, Joe, Joe, and I was getting the word Adam. If that's you, please come. I want to pray for you. Please come. I find it funny that there be a Joe here, but we've got to look real hard. Joe Adams. I'm sorry? My name's Joe Adams. They call you Joe. <laughs> okay. Stretch your hands to order. See, I really, I really, I have to tell you guys, uh, well, it's a long story and you wouldn't believe it if I told you, but let's just say I'm wearing the right boots to prophesy this way tonight. I wanted to say this, that, uh, that God has something amazing for you and it's beyond what you can comprehend. And you're going up to a new level, and there have been those that have tried to keep you from going to that next level. And so there's been struggle in going to the next level. And I mean that in regard to finances. I mean it in regard to relationships. I mean it in regard to family members that have said some very hurtful things, and they put their hooks in to try to drag you down from being all that you could be. But the Lord also spoke to me to tell you, even though that you are from Adam, he says, you're not of Adam. So know that, that even though there was a, a from Adam, you're not of him. You're of, you're of his DNA. You're of the king's DNA. And so things are going to start to turn around. Now I want to prophesy three specific things in regard to financial miracles for you. Uh, the, they're going to come in, it's going to come in a group of three. And, uh, and these will be in, in, in forms of, one will be a letter in the mail. The other will be someone that just uh, gives you a benevolent love gift. And the other will be some sort of a settlement. And I'm not exactly sure what that means, but it'll be some sort of a settlement, some sort of a thing that you didn't even know was there. So you're going to have a, a, a concurrence of blessings, and it'll come in threes. And I said, Lord, why threes? He said, because after the first set of threes, there's going to be another set of threes. I said, that's six, Lord. I said, now six is man's number. He says, no, I'm going to add one more blessing, one more over-the-top overflow blessing. I'm going to add on one more. That'll be seven. And that'll be when you know the work is complete. The Lord says, behold, I make all things new. Don't look into the mirror of the past, Joe, but you are a new creature and you are about to be released into new vistas and new venues and the Lord this night has called you out by name fully. Fire of God on you right now. Shoot God. Go free. Keep on God. Whatever you feel I just had to move on. Shot. Zuka. I like it. I like it when God just walks in the room. He, he walks in the room and, and we're amazed. We call it the supernatural. He comes walking in the room and, and the, the only thing that amazes God is when no one responds. I mean, my goodness. He stuck his head out the window of heaven one time and said light. And according to scientists today, Space is still unfolding and expanding on itself. Because when he said light, he never said stop. He spoke one word eons ago. And we're wondering if he can speak and fix what's going on in our lives right now. You don't have to stick his head out. We don't 
heaven for that. He just sends one of us. His hand extended. I, I, I love the way God moves in and gets in the interpersonal things of our life. Somebody, somebody said, what, what do you think the deal is with all the, like, the numbers and all that? God wants us to be intrigued, to be drawn in. I'll, I'll tell you a secret. There was a reason that the man at the pool of Bethesda was healed publicly. He was at a pool with five porches full of sick people. Jesus did it publicly so everybody else there would want some. Yeah. He wasn't showing off. If he would have been showing off, he would have healed the first guy he came walking up to. He specifically looked for a man who had kingdom purpose in his life. He was not intending just to heal his body. He was healing his spirit so that he would leave that house of suffering and go into the house of God and become a healer himself. And if you read on down about five verses later, it says, and finding him later in the temple. Jesus found the man from the pool. That's a very interesting thing then. He said, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon me. I'm going to leave y'all with this, with this thought. I was making a point earlier about the things that we declare or determine to be sin or not sin. And, and, and it's really easy to get caught up in theological quagmires and cultural differences. But I want to present something to you tonight that God spoke to me the other day that it's probably going to, this is the thing that I'm going to say that some of you are going to go out of here saying this is a hard to say and you're going to scratch your head. It's going to help you to decide to whom shall we go. I want to present to you tonight that in the eyes of God, there is but one sin. Just one. Oh, all the stuff that we call sin, that's not really sin, that's the fruit of sin. Adultery is not a sin, it's a fruit. It's produced by something much deeper. Now, there are lists in the Word of sin. I find it interesting that we have a difficult time grasping the reality that all of those lists were written by men. I would, I would like to present to you the reality that in the eyes of God there is only one sin, and that sin is to refuse relationship with Jesus. Denying Christ. Prove it to you. They got your Bible? Don't turn to Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. We, we, we'll just do verse 9. Verse 9 says that if a man will confess with his mouth and believe in his heart, the Lord Jesus. You're welcome to go ahead and read the rest of those two verses. It never once in those two verses says the word sin or repentance. The only thing it talks about that we need to repent from is our lack of knowledge of Christ. Mm -hmm. Because if I have known Him, and I accept him. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Try that in your life. Try, instead of abiding by the rules that will give you permission to live and make it into eternity without ever having to know Jesus, try fulfilling the rules because you have known Jesus. I don't do the things that I don't do not because some denomination told me or mama told me or daddy trained me. 
I live the life I live because I know Jesus. I am his and he is mine. Oh, I can tell all y'all's wheels are spinning. Oh, we're all looking at me like this guy has lost his ever loving mind. No, this is awesome. Think about it. It's wonderful. What has a man gained if he gained the whole world and loses his own soul? Why is that soul so necessary? Because your soul, are you ready? And, and then I promise I'll sit down. Because your soul is the last remnant of heaven left in your physical body. Wow. Say that again. Your soul is the last remnant of heaven left in your natural body. That's the residue from God breathing the breath of life into you. That's the soul. It's not knowing him forgivable? Absolutely. You just did it. You just did it. It's, it's to make people look for some they fancy prayer. They make it too hard, prayer. don't they? They're looking for some too fancy hard. prayer. The moment you said him, you confessed. I can't call him him if he's not. Real. Thank you, Lord. In a life without, in a life without relationship with Jesus, is a life that will spawn what we call sin. It will it's because true. you're not connected to him, so you'll bear fruit that doesn't bear witness to. The Christ. But I don't know about you. I feel like we're in a room full of people that are wanting to bear some Christ fruit. Come on. How many? How many? Amen. So I will say this. And, and I think this is a good thing for us to be reminded of. We don't hear a lot of teaching about this. And I think we should probably hear more. But the King James Version, for those that that's important to. The King James Version that's what Jesus of the Bible says that all who call on the name of the yeah. Lord shall be saved. Can I tell you something? There are going to be some folks make it into heaven that we didn't think made it because when they were barreling down the highway, spinning high on drugs, they had just raped somebody and murdered somebody and barreling down that highway, they lose control of their car and while they're spinning out of control headed towards the center pilot on that bridge, they scream out, Oh God, or Oh Jesus, or Lord help me. Yes. And according to my Bible, the fact that they spoke His name indicated that they believed in like last one, Judas. He's going to be at the supper with you. Because he acknowledged Christ. The day he betrayed him, he first went and gave his sacrifice of atonement. The sacrifice of atonement under the law did not forgive sins. It pushed your sins ahead by a year. Those sins were then forgiven by the shedding of your own blood. So when Judas betrayed Christ, he had already given the sacrifice of atonement and had been the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat by the priest. Then he betrayed Christ, and then we know the story. He went into the woods and hung himself, you say, yeah, but he committed suicide. But he had already given the sacrifice of atonement. His suicide and betrayal were already pushed ahead, and when he spilled his own blood, he was forgiven. So powerful. Who knows? Maybe when we get to heaven, your name card will be next to his. So, I want you to lift your hands to heaven. How many have enjoyed tonight? Lift up a shout. Yeah. I want you to. I want you to. I want you to stand to your feet tonight. But we're going to do something to that will always make a prophet uncomfortable. We are going to. We are going to. Number one, set ourselves. You know, I love it in the scripture. I just want to say, you know. There are some Abrahams and Sarahs in the room. There are some people that need a geographical shift. You need to change positions. Lord says, for some of you, just stretch your hands toward heaven. 
The Lord is saying, you need to move away from what's familiar. The Lord says, I'm going to reveal as I go. He says, you might even need to space yourself from family and friends and relationships. He says, there's always, I will always, anytime I'm going to move, I am first going to promise you something. I will promise the movement that is to come. And uh, I want to also say, according to Hebrews 11, chapter 8, verses 12, it's all by faith. By faith we obey and we're called up to go. To go. Everybody say by faith. By faith. by faith we went out not knowing where He was going. By faith He lived in His promise in a foreign country. This is Hebrews 11. By faith Sarah received strength to conceive even when she was past her age. And here's how I feel to put a bow apostolically on tonight. How many have enjoyed tonight? Yeah. I want to say this. Tomorrow, tomorrow, we can go ahead and play. I don't know if there's a little something, some uh, CD stuff we could play back there, but maybe just some light piano, just something light. But I want to say this tonight. Tomorrow is a key day because in Louisiana, especially in Lafayette, there's a bunch going on on Friday night. People have their church things going on on Wednesday, understood. Thursday, the Lord told me, I want you to make Thursday a special night. We were going to do it tonight, and then, of course, long travel for Prophet Allen, and, uh, and we want to make sure everybody's fresh. Tomorrow, I want to do something I've only done twice before, but I had the opportunity many years ago, and it's an opportunity only afforded to some God's generals and some prophets, but I preached at Glad Tidings in San Francisco. Smith Wigglesworth preached there. And when Wigglesworth preached there, many, many years later, I preached there. And someone who was there when Wigglesworth preached, how many have ever heard of Smith Wigglesworth? Yeah. So they gave me a very special gift. They gave me some oil that he had anointed. Wow. And so, listen, the power's not in the oil, but I'm going to be honest with you. If you have a need tomorrow, I say you need to bring the sick, you need to bring the hungry, you need to bring the lost, you need to bring your friends, you need to bring your intercessor friends, your worshiper friends, because tomorrow night, Prophet Allen and I are going to take as long as it takes to go down and anoint people with oil, and we're going to anoint you with that special anointing oil, which I varies, I think I've only brought it out once, maybe, maybe twice. But that oil was given to me as a gift. And the Lord said, David, if you'll lay hands on people with that Smith Wigglesworth anointing oil, he said there is going to be an outbreak of radical signs and wonders in the marketplace, in the homes, in the schools. Somebody say hallelujah. In the restaurants. The Lord says, I'm bringing it to Lafayette. So, and I also want to say this. I want to say this. You will conceive even though you're past the age. In other words, people may say, it's over. You're not going to accomplish that which God has set before you. I'm here to tell you that we are standing together saying, we are going through that door together. We will not be denied. We will conceive. Somebody say hallelujah. So what I want you to do right now if you'll stand with me tonight and say, we're standing that we would bring and that we would conceive and bring to full term that which the Lord, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has birthed in our hearts. I want you to come as quick as you can. And I want you to fill this middle area. Come right now. Come right now. Come right now. Come right now. The Spirit of the Lord is so mighty in this house. You can come right up to here. Come on right up into here. There's plenty of room in here. Plenty of room around this piano area. Come on right now. And I want you to come with your hands lifted. And then I'm going to invite Prophet Allen. I'm going to invite him to pray a prayer of sealing. And we're going to go there together. Now tomorrow night's going to be a special anointing service. And we want to get on Facebook, on Twitter, let everybody know what we're doing here. But I'm going to have Prophet Allen pray a prayer that brings things full term. In other words, you are going to conceive even though you are past the age of conception. And I want Him to pray that. Now listen, this is not a frivolous thing. If you're believing, 
If you're holding on to hope for something to manifest, this is that time to just stretch to heaven right now and just say, God, bring it to pass. He's going to pray a prayer of conception and birthing. Come on, stretch to heaven right now. Show Ramazah. Prophesy. Come on. That the seed of the Spirit will impregnate every life in this place. I call back to life every wound that has been silent. I restir life. Right now, I seal within each of these vessels that seed that it might begin germinating within and producing all that you have spoken that it would be. I tear down every decree that has been made over each individual as well as over this corporately. I tear down every assignment of the enemy and I post warring angels with each of these believers that will protect them until the time that they can produce a gatherable harvest from this seed. I seal the word of the Lord upon every heart, every mind, every spirit, and every soul. I awaken dreams and visions, ideas, plans. I give guidance and direction. I open the doors that have been closed and close the doors that should never have been opened. And we decree in this place, the kingdom of God lives in us. We call it to life and we receive it sealed by the blood and the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody lift up a shout. To the what, I, what I want to do right now is I want you, we do this every, every time we get together and every night's different. What I want you to do is I want you to find two, three people at the most. Not a Hands Across America, not a Kumbaya moment. I want you to get three at the most, but let's...